Good evening. Welcome to the Arts Arena. Tonight, coming to you from Paris and Brittany, France, and a first from quarantine in Montreal, Canada. Should you hear a knock on the door during this live streaming and see uniform, uniformed officers appear, please know that they are just coming to check that our speaker tonight is indeed inside and locked down in her hotel room. I am Marjorie Arendt Sapphire, founder and artistic director of the Arts Arena. Once more, I would like to thank our partner, Columbia Global Centers, for its technical support in making this live streaming possible. And also French Arts Arena board member, Doris Donny, for introducing us to tonight's guest, Denise Wendell Poré. One of the founding principles of the Arts Arena at the very top of our mission statement is to energize connections among artistic disciplines and between the arts and the worlds of business, economics, finance, cultural diplomacy, sciences, and sustainable development. In a word, multidisciplinarity. We like to break the silos that too often isolate artistic disciplines from one another, as well as those silos that separate the arts as a whole from what is commonly known as the real world. And we have done just that for over 13 years and 300 Arts Arena events. This is also why we chose in 2018 for our inaugural gala in New York, the legendary meeting of artistic disciplines as the theme for the gala. It was the Ballet Parade, parade created for Serge Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. Just listen to the cast of multidisciplinary creators. Jean Cocteau for the scenario, Eric Satie for the music, Leonid Massine for the choreography, Pablo Picasso for the set design, curtain, and costumes, and to top things off, Guillaume Apollinaire for the program notes. On the same occasion in, and in that same spirit, we brought together to honor five exceptional figures in diverse disciplines of the arts. Dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov, film director James Ivory, arts philanthropist Dina Kay, visual arts curator and scholar Robert Storr, and theater artist Robert Wilson. Tonight's Arts Arena program goes in that very same direction. Painting the stage brings together the visual arts, stage design, and the performing arts, not ballet, but opera, because Denise Wendel Poré began as a mezzo-soprano. A Canadian writer, journalist, and curator, holding degrees from Yale, McGill, and the École Normale de Musique. She is the author of books and essays concerning the relationship among art, theater, and music, including the book that gave its name to tonight's presentation, Painting the Stage, 200 Years of Stage Design by Artists, published in 2018. She has been guest curator at the Lembrook Museum in Duisburg, where she worked on the major exhibitions Lembrook's Kneeling Woman, 100 Years, 1911 to 2011, and Woman's Life and Love from the Clocker Collection. In Austria, she co-curated an exhibition on William Kentridge at Salzburg's Museum Repertinum, as well as the exhibition's elective affinities at the Museum Sammlung Friedrichshof in Zirndorf and Otto Mühl in Salzburg. In Paris, she has curated solo exhibitions of artists Hermann Nietzsche and Howard Hodgkin. She has given seminars on theater design by artists at the prestigious Kunz Academy in Dusseldorf and has written for Opera Canada Magazine, Art Press, Quotidien de l'Art, Art Review, and the Wiener Courier. Her talk will be accompanied by stunning images and will be followed by a Q&A. So please hit chat 
and send us your questions. It is my great pleasure to present to you from her solitary quarantine in Montreal, Denise Wendell Proré, painting the stage. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you very much for this introduction. And thank you for inviting me to the Arts Arena. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Michel Kovic for the, for the technical side of things, as well as Samantha Zeng. And I'd also like to, to thank very much Doris and at Donnie for so many things. And uh, also because they were so instrumental in, in helping with the book, even before I had an, an editor. And I'd like to thank my editor, Eduardo Gizzoni, who was really a driving force behind getting the book out and getting it on the shelves. And, and he continues to be a huge support. So thanks to those people. Um, I guess I'd like to start by explaining why, I mean, how I got involved in all of this and, and uh, what was sort of the, the, the spark uh, behind painting the stage. And it actually goes back to 2009 uh, when Gérard Mortier, who was then uh, the director of Paris Opera, uh, asked me, uh, I'd been writing articles for their programs, if I wouldn't like to interview uh, Anson Kiefer, the great uh, German uh, artist, uh, concerning a show that he was uh, developing for the, the Bastille Opera entitled Am um, Anfang, or In the Beginning. And uh, of course, I, I I immediately accepted and it was a great honor, but I was very, very nervous about it. Uh, first of all, because I didn't know anything about this, this production, no one knew anything about it. And uh, the opera uh, uh, provided me just with a, a recording by Jörg Widmann, the virtuoso clarinetist and composer who uh, wrote the music for uh, Kiefer's piece, Aman Pan. So with that to go on, uh, and just a few weeks to, um, to actually prepare the discussion with, with, with Anselm Kiefer, I decided to you know, look at as much work as I could, find everything I could about him and sort of develop some ideas that, of, of, a, of, of a way in and, and, and having a discussion with him about this piece that I knew nothing about. And um, one of the pieces of, of, of Kiefer's that, that really struck me at the time was in the, um, the uh, Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. And I think probably one of Kiefer's most important pieces is called The Angel of History, Poppy and Remembrance from uh, 1989. Uh, the work holds the key to much of Kiefer's art, which is strongly influenced by the philosophy of Walter Benjamin and the idea that historical redemption is the process of retrieving the suppressed from amnesia and the return to the foreground of historical writing in memory. In the end, I would understand that this is very much the theme of his piece, Amamvan. So the other thing that, that, um, that helped very much was uh, going to the Kruhle Müller Museum in Otterlo in the Netherlands, where there's a collection of works, earlier works by Anson Kiefer that are um, inspired by the works of Richard Wagner. Uh, there's a, there are paintings, watercolors, woodcuts, and books on Wagnerian themes with titles such as Siegfried, Vergist Brunhilde, Tod, or Parseval one, two, and three. And this one, Siegfried's Difficult Road to Brunhilde. For the artist, these were informed in part by recordings of Wagner's operas, to which he was listening at the time, but were also the reflection of a larger exploration of post-war taboos, including the symbols and cultural icons of the Third Reich, which he was concurrently confronting in his work. This was particularly, particularly instructive for preparing the interview and understanding his connection to the operas of Richard Wagner. When the, day, when the day came to meet Anselm Kiefer, though I'd accumulated a lot of information um, and visual impressions, I still found it difficult to formulate uh, a question about this mystery production. I decided to bring him a gift to break the ice. I found a copy of the score of four minutes and 33 seconds by John Cage. Apart from the beautiful, apart from the beautiful uh, edition cover, it is a very sparse core, uh, 
score, indeed almost completely white, composed in 1952. The score instructs the performer not to perform their instruments for the entire duration of the piece. Michelle, could you come back to the screen, please? Thank you. When, when, uh, when I gave Kiefer, Kiefer the, the cage score, uh, he laughed and it was effectively a kind of a, uh, an icebreaker. And we, uh, of course, uh, it opened up discussion about, about Robert Rauschenberg, whose white paintings inspired this, this piece uh, by John Cage. Um, then Kiefer also spoke about the immateriality of music and how he felt that music is superior to the visual arts in the sense that music can penetrate. He says music penetrates into our DNA, into our hair, into our bodies, and that it's in that sense it's, it's even more powerful than the visual arts. So this discussion went on for, for uh, about two hours, and then the next day uh, he invited me uh, to look at some uh, of his rehearsals at the um, at the his uh, in Kwasi. Uh, okay, um, Michelle, you're getting ahead. Uh, this is, could you move back please to about three? Again, back, all right, here we are. Right there, that's good, that's good, stop. So uh, in Kwasi, um, Anselm Kiefer had built uh, all of the stage uh, that he would have done uh, then later for, at, at the Basti. Um, Kwasi was an old, um, car factory, so just in immense space for, for, um, for building uh, art. Um, so I sat in on rehearsals and uh, this is the moment when I started to think about, and this book uh, took form in my mind. Um, the, um, the, the points that I, you know, when, when I was talking to Kiefer about these rehearsals uh, as, we uh, discussed um, these. Um, could you go back one one slide, please, uh, Michelle? So the right. So the um, the idea that for him these rehearsals were also something that later would actually produce. Um, and encourage him to do paintings it was what it became one of the central ideas of the of the book itself. Uh, asking myself the question, how uh, did uh, the the participation in uh, uh, a stage design affect the artist's own work in the studio? And as uh, Kiefer put it, it would be you know paintings in the future would come out of this uh, rehearsal process. So. One of the reasons I, um, you know, I, I went back and I started uh, in history back in 1816 with the um, with the works of uh, Schinkel. This was the beginning of my. So one more up, Michelle, please. This is going to be very complicated. Okay, could you go down one more? Right. No. Move forward. Right. One more. Right, thank you. This is Schinkel. So one of the reasons I started with um, Karl Friedrich Schinkel's uh, Zauberflöte, uh, Magiklöte, is because it influenced so many uh, our visual artists in the decades that followed. Um, you can see, for instance, in this next slide uh, by Simon Quaglio, a design that was done two years later, where Quaglio very clearly um, borrows uh, Schinkel's idea of the star-spangled sky uh, over the, uh, the head of the um, Queen of the Night. And the next slide, uh, these are, you can see these are further uh, designs by Quaglio, who was a very accomplished, not artist, but stage designer, but for his time when stage design could be very, um, very ordinary, he was extremely sophisticated and um, did historically very accurate stage designs uh, and very sophisticated stage designs. And one more. Um, so this is a design by uh, Alfred uh, Roller, not for the not for the um, uh, Salberflut or the Magic Flute, but rather for the Frau ohne Schatten by Strauss. But nevertheless, he's borrowing Schinkel's idea of the star-spangled sky 
if we go a little further along, one more slide. Here we have um, also a Zauberflute, a magic flute by Edward uh, Duberg. Um, again, he's referring to Schinkel. Uh, one more uh, slide, please. And here we have uh, William Kentridge with his Queen of the Night and his version of Schinkel's uh, Star Spangled Sky. So this, uh, this was uh, you know, the, the beginning of my book. Um, and I think probably the, the next major step in uh, stage design was that of uh, Richard Wagner himself, who of course uh, in, this, uh, in his self-designed special house, of course inspired by Gottfried Semper, um, started his own revolution in stage design. First of all, the auditorium can be completely darkened. Uh, there are curtains over the entry doors and the orchestra pit is covered, not only for acoustic reasons, but also to provide complete darkness conducive to the immersive experience, uh, the concentration necessary for the realization of his Gesamtkunstwerk. The Gesamtkunstwerk is a term that uh, Wagner used in two books uh, between 1849 and 1851, Art and Revolution and Art of the Future, Artwork of the Future. Um, according to Wagner, the Gesamtkunstwerk is an ideal musical, poetical, and visual work that would actually unify all art forms via the theater. His Speschbierhaus that you see here opened in 1876 with the complete four cycle opera, Der Ring des Nebelungen. Wagner was so dissatisfied with, the, um, with the, 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 the production that he swore that for his next opera, Parsifal, that he would not uh, even stage it. It would have to be just an oratorio unless he found a real artist to do the stage design. And he tried, he approached uh, Arnold Buckling, who refused. He also approached uh, Hans Markert, who was a very fashionable uh, artist at the time, who, who somehow that did not come, come to fruition. And finally, and here's the next slide, um, he was introduced to uh, a young Russian painter called Paul von Yukovsky, Paul von Yukovsky. And he was impressed with his paintings and invited Yukovsky to join him and Cosimo on a trip of Northern Italy, uh, which, um, which Yukovsky immediately accepted. He was, he'd been traveling himself in Italy and uh, dropped uh, the author Henry James, whom he was traveling with, uh, to join rather uh, Wagner and Cosimo. Um, and uh, perhaps for that reason, uh, Henry James always professed a hate of Wagner's music. Here you have the Good Friday Meadow, and, and in the next slide, you see the same uh, Good Friday Meadow, but in its uh, physical rendering is stage design. At the time, it was very difficult, uh, the, you know, the transition be, be, be between the idealized uh, drawing of the, of the artist and the actual physical stage decor was often very disappointing. Um, but you have to keep in mind that in 1882, uh, stage lights in the Feshbiel house were gas fueled and uh, still made use of traditional footlights at the front of the stage that illuminated the performers from below. It wasn't until 1888 that the theater got electricity. Next slide, please. When, when they visited the Siena Cathedral together, Wagner, overcome with emotion, asked Yukovsky to make an exact replica of the famous monument for the Hall of the Grail scene in Parsifal. Here you have a photo of the actual stage set um, and enjoying, it enjoyed exceptional longevity, this production. Uh, it would be uh, produ produced in exactly the same way, except for act two, for about 200, 205 times during 27 Bayreuth festivals up until 1933, when at the request of Adolf Hitler, it was replaced uh, by a design by the artist Alfred Roller, and there was a new production then. This photo is from 1930. May I have a full screen, please? Yes. Okay. So um, 
there was an artist sitting in the audience of that uh, 1882 uh, premiere. His name was Adolf Apia, he's a young man, he was only 20 years old. And Apia, uh, he hated the production. Uh, he, it was just the opposite for him. Uh, he, he loved the, uh, as Kiefer would put it, the immateriality, the uh, ethereal um, music of Wagner and found that these, these sets ruined the whole effect of what, uh, of what Wagner was trying to achieve. Uh, and that Yukovsky hadn't done uh, a better job than, than those before him. And he was so angry about this that he, he went off um, and went to, went to theater school and uh, started to think very much about a complete renovation of the whole idea of stage design and the whole idea of theater. And he wrote a book uh, and it, in, which came out in 1895, The Staging of the Wagnerian Drama. And the book at the time had a huge impact. It um, was read by, um, well, Alfred Roller, who was one of the most uh, famous uh, and most um, um, uh, popular, really, uh, stage designers at, at the time, also uh, Mariano Fortuny. Um, but, you know, and up to, to today, uh, artists like uh, uh, Robert Wilson constantly refer to Appiah uh, and his way of, of using light uh, rather than uh, illustrating a drama. He would just uh, use very few forms in light, which is actually very much what Robert Wilson does as well. Uh, he was also an example for, uh, for Wieland Wagner. So this was really a turning point, a very serious turning point in the whole idea of stage design. Um, may I have the next slide, please? But as you can see, these are very radical. And so therefore, poor Apia, he had very little success in producing any kind of real stage design. Uh, he sent these to Cosima Wagner, uh, who, who compared them, who laughed at them, and really scorned them, uh, and uh, said that they resembled uh, the Norwegian explorer Fijok Nansen's photographs of the North Pole. Could show the next two, please. And the next one, please. In the meantime, uh, in Paris, one of the most uh, important events, uh, artistic events at the chain, chain, turn of the century was uh, Claude Debussy's Pelias and Melisande. Here you have a photo of uh, Mary Garden uh, in the role of uh, Melisande. She was the first Melisande. And in spite of the fact of the, you know, the, the radical modernity of uh, Debussy's music, with Pelias and Melisande, uh, and all the controversy around the production. When you look at the stage sets, uh, may I have the next slide? The, um, the, st the sets are extremely uh, conventional, illustrative. I mean, everything that, uh, that Adolf Apia was against. Um, may I have the full screen again? Claude Debussy, uh, belonged to the close circle of Stefan Malamé. Uh, Stefan Malamé, who's the head uh, of the, the symbolist movement. Um, Malamé, his adage to the, the symbolists and, and to artists at the time was a dictum, which he said, nommer un objet, c'est supprimer les trois quarts de la jouissance du poème, qui fait du bonheur de diviner peu à peu, le suggérer, Voila le rêve, or naming the object, is to reduce the three quarters of its effect, which is made of the pleasure of discovering little by little. This statement strongly affected the whole generation of symbolists and also Apia and Debussy. Malamé's, Malamé's plea for non-objective, non-narrative poetry was an important advancement towards abstraction in the arts. Another of his poems, Un coup de dé jamais n'abolera le hasard, The Roll of the Dice Will Never Abolish Chance from 1897, with its intimate combination of free verse and typographic uh, layout, anticipated 20th century interest in graphic design and concrete poetry, and particularly the Russian futurist poets such as Velimir Klebnikov, and I'm coming to him next. Uh, so that we can talk about the Russian avant-garde and stage design in Russia. Um, 
and that and there's there's a very important piece and a very important event that took place in 1913 in Russia. May I have this next slide? This is, this is a, a photo uh, of Trebnikov and uh, and uh, the other collaborators in in this famous piece uh, called the Victory Over the Sun. Uh, you have the founder, of course, of the avant-garde uh, supremacist movement, Kazimir Malevich, who created the costumes and the decor. You have Velimir Klebnikov and the another futurist writer, Alexei Kruchtenev, who wrote the text and the music by uh, Mikhail Mitiusin. The, the opera was given two performances only in December of that year. Only fragments of the text and 24 bars of the score remain. The original duration was just 45 minutes. It involved an abstract poetic language called tsaum, in which meaning was indeterminate and words were a vehicle of free expression rather than sense. A remarkable aspect of the stage decor was the backcloth by Malevich, depicting a, a black square placed against the sun an image that predated the artist's first official non-objective artwork, the famous black square by two years. The painting itself wasn't ex exhibited until the last futurist exhibition in Petrograd in 1915. This way, the, the theater served as a hotbed of experimentation that spawned a milestone in the history of art. Full stage, please. And full screen. The work is frequently referred to as the zero point in painting, referring to the painting's historical significance and paraphrasing Malevich's adage, it is from zero in zero that the true movement of being begins. More than a universal leap forward, the black square is part of a complex transition between represent representational painting and abstract painting. The black square, which began as a piece of stage design, has become one of the key shorthands, and touchstones and symbols of the beginning of abstract art. Another member of the Russian avant-garde who made an impact this time on mainstream opera, um, may I have the slide? One more slide. Voila, this is Natalia Goncharova. In 1913, Goncharova was uh, discovered by the great impresario and founder of the Ballet Russe uh, uh, that was mentioned earlier by Marjorie, uh, Sergei Diaghilev. He visited an exhibition of Natalia Goncharova in 1913 in Moscow and immediately engaged her to come to Paris and to design the uh, Rimsky Korsakovs, the Golden Cockerel, for the Ballet Russe season. Only 32 years old at the time, Goncharova was, was an important member of the young leftist art uh, group in Moscow, but she was virtually unknown in Paris. She uh, had huge success. The, um, the Cockerel was uh, produced at the Palais Garnier in 1914, and her extraordinary palette of colors really uh, interested uh, the, 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 the critic and also the, the Parisian public uh, and got more attention probably than, than Michel Fouquin's choreography. Uh, 10 years later, if you show the next slide, uh, you can see that her style has completely changed and, and what has happened uh, in the meantime. This is a design for Igor Stravinsky's Les Nos. The folk art costumes were replaced with simple uniforms of white and browns. Larinov's, Larinov, her partner, saw these new designs as communal costumes without distinction or character or social standing, in keeping with the new egalitarian standards of the Soviet Union. We have full screen, please. The, the cataclysm and aftermath of the First World War brought drastic changes to artistic vision. Highly contrasted movements emerged. And in the case of Igor Stravinsky, there was a paring down of his work, a return to absolute music. 
uh, a return to concise, light musical textures and small ensembles that came to be associated with this neoclassical period with works such as Le Renard or the, the chamber opera, uh, Mavra. In hindsight, Les Nos was a work that marked a watershed in the styles of also Natalia um, Bronislava uh, Nijinska, who is the, the choreographer, that of Goncharova, and also of Igor Stravinsky. With this production, the Ballet Russe, rather than portraying, as they had up until then, an idealized fairy tale Russia, became the mirror of political and artistic changes that were taking place in the newly formed Soviet Union and the distinct aesthetic values that emerged from it. Now I'm going to go very fast forward because I think I, I, I'm running out of time. Uh, there's an there's a important turning point, of course, here uh, after the First World War and leading up to the Second World War in the 1920s, uh, particularly in Berlin, uh, where you have uh, the Russian avant-garde and the ba Bauhaus avant-garde all involved in, also involved in stage design. Uh, the Kroll opera was particularly important with its director, Otto Klemperer, and the, um, the, the, the number of productions and the originality of the productions that was done there uh, in the late Weimar period is, is, is really astounding. Um, but as, as you know, uh, with, with the rise of, of, of fascism, uh, Otto Klemperer was, um, was, was fired in 1931, and the house was officially closed uh, shortly after. So this this was a this was a, a, a big um, a big barrier now for for advancement uh, in stage design by these these Bauhaus and uh, avant garde artists. At the same time, in Russia, in 1929, with the exile of Leon Trotsky, and above all, the re resignation of the Progressive Culture Minister writer and intellectual Anatoly Lunacharsky and Stalin's rise uh, to absolute power. Uh, the, it, it signaled the onslaught of, of this cataclysmic era whereby uh, free expression would be, would be attacked. Um, there, there's a long list of the persecutions, the murders and executions of aforementioned members of the Russian avant-garde, such as Klebnikov, and Mayakovsky and, and Meyerhold. Now for the next cliche, please. The Glyndebourne Festival, which is depicted here at the, uh, in 1938, which opened officially in 1938, founded by John, John Christie, became a safe haven, not only for children who'd been evacuated from London and housed in Glyndebourne for safety, but for, for prominent figures in the opera business who were fleeing Nazism, such as the director uh, um, Karl Ebert and the conductor Fritz Busch, and the young Viennese impresario Rudolf Bing, who would become the general director of, uh, of the new festival and later the artistic director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York. This was a highly prestigious direction team for this fledgling festival. They in turn invited a number of prominent stage designers, such as Bertolt Brecht's designer, Kaspar Nea. The English in this way got an idea of the way stage design was being done by artists of the Neue Sachlichkeit or the new objectivity movement and, the, and a level of visual sophistication that they had not seen up until then on opera stages. Next cliche. This is the design by uh, Kaspar Nair for uh, Verdi's Macbeth, which would be the inaugural performance at uh, Glyndebourne in, in 1938. Uh, you can see how influenced he is by Goya, and uh, there's a, a number of writings by Bertolt Brecht uh, about Goya. So you can see that this is this has found its way into these designs. Uh, and in the next one, um, cliche. This is actually a photo of that same scene. Uh, this is actually the Berlin production, uh, which, which then came to Glyndebourne. Uh, and it is the, the photo is from 1935. Now I'm gonna go very quickly forward because I know I'm running out of time. And I'd just like to show you quickly uh, the chronology of my book. Um, uh, so the next cliche is, uh, now this is Balthus, 
Baltus in this beautiful drawing uh, for uh, decor for Cosi Van Tutte at the uh, Aix-en-Provence festival in 1950, just two years after the, the festival opened, just shortly after the Second World War. Uh, other artists were, were producing stage design there, very famous artists, um, André Derain, um, for example. Uh, if you, the next cliche, you can see how this, uh, this has become stage decor. You can imagine that um, the means in X in 1950 were very limited for uh, building stage decor. Uh, Balthus actually painted the, the, the backdrops himself with the help of André Durand. Um, and we move on now to the next one, if we just go very slowly. This is, as you probably can tell, Salvador Dali um, doing uh, a stage design for La Dama Spagnola um, of Scarlatti. And in the next uh, cliche, you can see how it's been transformed into stage design. You can see the dancer, very famous dancer at the time, Ludmina Cherina. Uh, dancing the role of La Dama Española. And in the next uh, cliche, you see a drawing by uh, Kokoschka. This is his drawing for the whole stage uh, for the Zauberflute, the magic flute that he did in Salzburg in 1955. It's designed for the, the Felsenreich Schule, which you see in the next cliche. And Kokoschka made no secret of the fact that he was very dissatisfied with the, the realization of his drawings in the form of stage decor. He even uh, accused the technician of purposely of sort of messing them up. But this, um, this is it. This is uh, Kokoschka's Magic Flute in 1955. And as is the next design, which, which next cliche, which is just a close up where you see the three boys up in the niches of the, of the Felsenreich Schule. The next uh, cliche, is, uh, is Henry Moore, of course, I think it's, it's recognizable. Uh, little is known about this because Henry Moore stipulated when he accepted the commission uh, from the director of the festival, uh, Giancarlo Minotti, that he didn't want anyone to know he was doing, uh, doing this. Uh, he also didn't want to be paid for it. So the, these, um, these designs uh, have remained very confidential, but I think they're extremely important. Next one, because they're, they're just so, so specifically uh, the, the work of, of of Henry Moore. Next are some drawings by Chagall. These are his drawings for his animals in the Magic Flute, uh, the production that he uh, did for the Metropolitan Opera, the opening of, of the Lincoln Center in 1967. Uh, the next uh, is actually a photo by Irv Irving Penn, who did a whole photo reportage for the Vogue magazine of the production in 1967 with portraits of Chagall and all of the singers and uh, he did not forget uh, the animals. In the next cliche, you see uh, an actual photo on the stage with um, Tamino uh, uh, enchanting the, uh, the animals with his, with his magic flute. Uh, the next ones are of Louise Nevelson. And I think this is the only stage design for opera that Louise Nevelson did, but you can see how she's, she's integrating her beautiful wall works into this uh, opera, Orfeo by Gluck. In the next cliche, you can see um, how the, 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 the wall work is just behind. Uh, she also designed the costumes and the jewelry that the, that the singer is wearing, that the Eurydice is wearing. The next scene, you can see the colors better. She's also designed um, just beautiful costumes. Um, the next uh, set of pictures is, so here we have, um, Giotto's flight into Egypt. And I'd just like to show how David Hockney for his magic flute borrowed from Giotto and didn't hesitate to borrow from the pre-Renaissance and Renaissance painting to, to, to have ideas for form. In the next cliche, you can see how he borrowed from Giotto's rocks and made his, uh, this, is a, this is a foam model uh, for his, um, or as act one, scene one uh, of the magic flute. And in the next one, you have um, Uccello's St. George and the Dragon. Well, look at the dragon. And in the next cliche, you can see how Hockney's stolen that dragon and, and made it his own for his magic flute. In the next cliche, you have uh, Chicanator, uh, this uh, depicting Chicanator in the role of uh, Papageno uh, for the original production and the cage uh, on his back. And this is 
but then uh, Hockney's borrowing of, of that, um, that original production. And here in the next one, you see what it looked like actually on stage. Um, may I have the full screen, please? This, this brings me to a point, uh, once again, in the book about how, um, how for the artist, uh, you know, once he's gotten involved and done the stage design, what it changes in his own work in the studio. And it's, it's really quite significant. Again and again, uh, uh, I've encountered this. And one of the things that, that David Hockney said about uh, getting involved in opera, especially with his, his, his very first, first opera, um, in Glyndebourne, which was um, which was the the Rex progress, uh, that the experience of doing it completely changed his way of painting. And I'll just quote uh, David Hockney after his experience of the Rex progress. He said, "Suddenly, I realized I'd find I'd found a way to move into another area. In a sense, I'd broken my previous attitudes about space and naturalism, which had been bogging me down." I'd found areas to step into which were fascinating, the space of the theatre. It also helped that it was a success, a big success, both critically and with audiences. Then I went back to, paper, to Paris and started painting. Over the next 10 years, Hockney would do many productions and, and all uh, very acclaimed, famous productions, one of Tristan and Isolde in particular, and Die Frau ohne Schatten. We have the next cliche, please. This is a drawing by the stage designer Richard Peduzzi for the uh, Gute Dämmerung. This is a production that was to mark, uh, it's called the Centennial Ring. It marked the centennial of uh, the opening of Bayreuth. And uh, this, this drawing, uh, as you can see in the next cliche, uh, when it is realized in, uh, in actual stage uh, decor is done brilliantly. And, and here we see that the, the technical uh, advancement in building stage decor. Um, of course, Richard Peduzzi is also an architect. So he, he really knows um, how to present his work and to a certain extent, how to be really involved in the, the building of it. Um, there, there was some, this, this particular uh, production was very important. First of all, uh, uh, Patrice Chereau uh, being the, the very great director that he is, and also uh, uh, Boulez, this was, a, this was a landmark production. And far from the mythical fable of the Nibelungen, the production places the work in the composer's historical and political setting in the mid 19th century, in the industrial era of early capitalism. This approach shocked the ultra-conservative festival audience in Bayreuth, leading to riots and even death threats against Peducci, Patrick Chéreau, and Pierre Boulez. In the next cliche, which is Arnold Buchling's uh, Isle of Death, you can see how, um, like Hockney, Peducci has borrowed from this directly. The next cliche you can see for his Rheingold. Next, I come to William Kentridge, uh, who is, a, is a, uh, one of our great living artists. He's world renowned for his ink and charcoal drawings and animation. And each of the hundreds of drawings that make up the films he uses then as projections and backdrops for his opera becomes have explosive power. Let's look at the next, uh, where you can see now that these, these drawings become projections in the next drawing um, is, yes, of course, of Alban Berg. Now look at the next projection, uh, the next, and you can see how it's projected onto the stage. And these have incredible impact um, when, when, you're, when you're in the audience and you're part of it. Um, you can move on now and look at the, the next. You can also see how, uh, this is from the, the London Coliseum um, version of this, uh, of this production. Which is sung in English, but you can see how uh, the, um, the the Lulu uh, is also dressed in paper. So the paper drawings actually work their way into the costumes. Um, this these were two just absolutely amazing uh, singers. There's Alva, you see there, is sung by Nikki Spence, and Lulu, uh, Brenda Ray. Then you have the Botic drawings that we just have a glimpse at. Uh, these were you know, whether or not they found their way into the actual projections that 
uh, that Kentridge then used for his production of Lotzek in, in Salzburg in, in 2017, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the case because when William Kentridge is pr producing an opera, he will take two to five years to do it. And the amount of work that he will produce around the project uh, will make, you know, like in the case of Kiefer, will, will become works, artworks, independent arts that uh, aren't necessarily attached to the opera, but it's the whole process of, of inspiration that comes from working on the, on the opera that then generates also these artworks. You can see the next one, please. And now uh, looking at these, these heads, uh, move on to the next, which uh, you can see some of them work their way also into, into the actual stage core. This is, this is the, uh, a photo of the stage uh, of the 200, 2017 uh, in, in Salzburg. Uh, in the, the next uh, cliche, I just very quickly wanted to, to brush over this amazing production uh, with Bill Viola um, and Peter Sellers of uh, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Uh, it was the first time perhaps that, it's, that such a famous uh, video artist got involved in opera in this way, in such a way that he actually produced a parallel story uh, to, uh, to Tristan and Isolde, uh, which was very controversial, of course. Uh, the next cliche, please. Uh, so you can see you've got the huge projection behind and the, the singers in, in very sober costumes uh, singing the opera in front of the, of the videos. This brings me to Haben Nietzsche, and uh, this is an artist whom I'm, I'm very actively involved with in, at the moment. Here you see him preparing his stage design for Herodiad, Massenet's opera. Uh, he uh, produced this opera at the uh, Wiener Staatsoper, at the Vienna State Opera in 1994. Let's just move through a couple of his designs. So this is the, um, this is the Herodiad. The next is, uh, this is Saint-François d'Assise by Messiaen. Uh, for this production, uh, Hermann Nietzsche did very much uh, something that was happening behind the actors in the front. It was, it was very much like one of his mal actions. could we have the next? Uh, and you can see you have Saint-François and the angel in the front and, and a whole uh, a bunch of uh, things happening and activity behind him. Um, may I have the full screen, please? The, the work, oh, yes. The work of Richard Wagner and the Bayreuth Festival uh, were of major importance to Hermann Nietzsche. The principles of Wagner's total artwork were crucial for Nietzsche, especially for his Théâtre of Orgies and Mysteries. These are performances and fast uh, ritualistic gatherings involving hundreds of participants, participants that he's been doing for decades. The invitation this year, and this is why I wanted to spend a bit of time with Nietzsche, to join the uh, Bayreuth Festival, the reopening of the Bayreuth Festival after this, this hiatus, um, and to produce uh, uh, a Malak student in conjunction with uh, Wagner's Walküre. So the Walküre will occur in a concert version and Hermann Nietzsche will produce behind the, the singers uh, a Malaxion. So uh, sort of the, what I was describing earlier and what you saw just now uh, in the Saint-François de Cis. This marks a, a, a major change also in the way that artists up to now have intervened in Bayreuth because he's not doing a decor. He's actually doing an independent artwork uh, in conjunction and in counterpoint with, uh, with Wagner's Walküre. Uh, what what Hamanich says about this experience that he's now building and he's preparing, he's in the preparatory stages of this of, of the Bayreuth uh, Festspiele, is that he as a, he's, a, he's very synesthetic, so that is, as he is someone who um, sees, uh, sees music um, and, um, and hears color. So he has this kind of synesthetic reaction to color and music. They go together, they mix together, those two sensations. And it's very much something that he, he plays with a lot in, his, in, his, his whole, in, in the whole structure of, of what he does in his performances. So this is, this is a major moment also for the Bayreuth Festival 
Festspiele to go ahead with something uh, so, so avant-garde, really, uh, and which has never been done. Um, next, I'd like to go through just a few more artists and then we'll stop for questions. I, um, the next cliche is, uh, well, this is a costume. Uh, before we leave Hermenich, this is a costume for um, Faust by Robert Schumann. Uh, and the next is also another costume. And then I'd like to go on to Daniel Richter, who we see here in front of his own stage design for Salzburg in 2010. It's a stage design for Lulu. In the next cliche, you can see Daniel actually painting his own, uh, own backdrop uh, in the Salzburg festival. And in the next cliche, you'll see what it looked like on stage. This is also the cover of my book. And uh, I'd like to mention here the name of Urs Schunebaum, who is a very, very important um, lighting designer and who works with artists like um, Alexander Poltzin and uh, also William Kentridge. Uh, and here the, the, the lighting played an extremely important role in the final realization of the pictures because it, it brought them to life or it put emphasis on certain aspects of the color uh, depending on the scene in, in Lulu. The next is uh, a painting by Jonathan Mese. And I'd just like to show how uh, Jonathan takes his pictorial language and brings it onto the stage in this next cliche. You can see uh, his design for Dionysus by uh, Vulcan Rim, Rim. And uh, this is just so clearly uh, a stage design by, by, um, by Jonathan that uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at. It was a very, very beautiful production. And the same would be if, if you look at these next cliches, uh, of decor uh, by Anish Kapoor. Uh, th this one, the next one in particular, you immediately in the next cliche recognize the style and uh, the, the um, artistic language of Anish Kapoor. And the same can be said in the next cliche for the butterfly of uh, Mariko Mori at the Fenici Opera uh, in Venice in 2015, especially this next you, you rec recognize the um, sculptural work of, of, of Mori. The next cliches are of the Lohengrin uh, by the artist Alexander Poltzin. And for people who know uh, Alexander's work, this, um, this is very close to some of his sculpture um, that he's, he's using and adapting here. Once again, this is a lighting design by Urs Schönebaum. And the next uh, cliche we can see as well, uh, how important, how absolutely vital that the lighting is, which is something that Adolf Apia said, this was one of the big part of his revolution is more try to, to speak with light uh, rather than um, illustrative uh, design. Uh, the next picture is uh, very beautiful. If you, uh, you have the source of light right in the center of the stage, which is quite unusual. And the next set of um, pictures and I will finish with these are, um, first of all, this is an artwork by the youngest artist in my book, uh, Philip Fruhofer. And uh, I picked this particular work because it was a work that um, motivated the uh, stage director, Stefan Herheim, to actually uh, engage uh, Philip to do a stage design because he was so fascinated with the way this is what, um, uh, Philip calls his light box paintings because when you turn them on, you have the illusory um, aspect, the um, an image that's a kind of a dream image on the top. But if you turn the light off, then you're suddenly in something much more, much more physical and real. And what interested Herheim was this this transition from from what is illusory to something that is that is actually physical and real. And uh, of course, there's a lot to do with the opera Eugene Onegin, which he um, wanted to absolutely to do with Philip uh, Fruhofer. If we can look at the next picture, you can see how uh, Philip then uh, made his models. He's a, he's a master model builder. Uh, and in the next picture, you'll see uh, what it looked like as, as, as physical stage design, also incredibly sophisticated. And, and uh, I must say with Philip Fruhofer, the things that he controls very well uh, in the full realization of his own, of his own designs. Um, and I'd just like to finish there, if I may, um, have the full screen, uh, to say that, um, may I have the full screen, that what I think is, is, is 
uh, important here, and particularly in the case of Verhofer and Stefan Herheim, is the way in which they work together uh, over months, like probably in almost a year and a half, not two years, of constantly meeting, listening to the music, Tchaikovsky's music together, um, developing the ideas of form. And, and also once they were in the theater and working with the great uh, conductor Maris Janssens, how that worked. And for me, that's the, the ideal um, uh, meeting point is when you have people who are willing and open to, to work together and to bring to fruition uh, wonderful productions, um, which was uh, uh, the case with this uh, Eugene Onegin uh, by Philip uh, Fruhofer. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Denise, and thank you for these absolutely gorgeous images. And I'm going to come in with a very different approach. You've taken us on a beautiful art historical voyage on the development of stage design. And my questions, I'm afraid, are going to be very terre à terre, as the French would say, very down to earth, basic, practical. And I'd like to start with the question of do you see any notable difference in a set design when it's done by a visual artist and when it's done by a professional set designer? Well, that depends very much on, on, the, on the artist. Um, you know, some, some stage design by artists is not very good. Uh, it, the, and, you know, there is this discrepancy between their idealized uh, vision of the opera and then what's really possible. Uh, so, so no, it, you know, it's not systematically better, that's for sure. Uh, you know, the more, uh, you know, when you, if you take someone like William Cantridge, who's a real homme de théâtre and, and really understands the theater, he's been working as a director since the, the late seventies and also is a great visual artist. There you have the absolute ideal uh, combination uh, because he controls both. Um, to answer your question perhaps more directly, there are some genius uh, uh, stage designers who don't consider themselves to be visual artists, who don't have a, a produce art uh, outside of the, the, the theater. And of course, they're, they're, they're just extraordinary. Um, you know, it's, it's um, no, I, I can't say that one is better than the other, but can it wasn't you- wasn't the question of better than the other, it was the question whether it was recognizable. No, I, I, a difference. No, not, not systematically. It really depends on case by case, uh, you know, whether or not uh, you can recognize it. Perhaps maybe the, the giveaway is when the stage design really does resemble the artwork of the artist. Um, for instance, if you look at the Anish Kapoor, you look at that and you realize that it's Anish Kapoor, so you recognize that it's an artist doing it. Uh, in those cases, when it's so recognizable, yes. Does a visual artist have to have a feel for music to design for opera? Some of them do and some of them don't. You know, uh, one, some of them will admit really to the difficulty they had um, actually penetrating, understanding uh, an opera and uh, some of them have absolutely no experience before they start. But then there's the process, you know, and, and uh, what, what they get out of it. Uh, once again, it's really, it's really difficult to generalize, generalize about it. Some of them have actually no idea about it. You mentioned Alexander Poulsen, who is a friend of the Arts Arena. He's been at the Arts Arena several times and we know his work uh, well. And I once asked him the question because, um, you know, he's a sculptor. He started out as a stonemason. He's worked in, in stone, wood, etc. I said, why does somebody who works in that kind of solid material, what attracts them to get involved in doing set designs? And I thought his answer was very interesting. He said, as a sculptor, every move I make is permanent. And whatever I do is permanent. And the theater is ephemeral. And that this intrigued him very, very much. And I wondered what you thought were other motivations that might drive a visual artist to uh, attempt stage design. Is it ego? Is it fame? Um, is it a new audience? Is it a new scale? What do you think motivates them? 
once again, it's very, it's very different depending on the artist. I mean, some artists are intrigued by the literature, by the text, by the theme of the opera, and they'll deal with that primarily in, in their design. Um, others are musicians and are, are actually love the music and know about the music. Uh, for some, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, to, to, to be in the theater. Um, some artists have said to me what, what was really wonderful in the experience of, of doing and, and of working in the theater was actually being with other people, working with the team, because an artist is, is a very solitary being, you know, working in a studio. And the, the idea and the, the actual experience of working with a huge team uh, is something that, that, that uh, many artists have found extremely uh, gratifying. For the opera itself, has having a well-known uh, artist, visual artist, become a commercial venture? Will more people buy tickets if it says sets by Anselm Kiefer? I think that, uh, yes, I mean, it could, it could be that, but you could also say that for any aspect of opera, you know, when you have a star, as soon as you bring in a star, it, 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 it sells tickets, uh, be it Jonas Kaufmann or, you know, uh, and one of the great conductors. But I think, um, I, I think that the, the, uh, the, how should I say, the, you know, the having, having someone, um, like uh, Anselm Kiefer, or a great name or a big name. Yes, of course it does. It does. Uh, it does attract people. But the interest is, I think, when you have a great artist or or an artist, uh, it allows people who are maybe more visually uh, um, gifted or uh, have a more of an in on individual arts and are less uh, informed about music to actually go to the opera and maybe get more out of it because the visual aspect is going to uh, pull them in, is going to help them to, to access the music. And when the visual aspect can help you to understand the music better, that, that, that's really optimal. Okay, I, we have questions that have come in. Um, I'm, this is from Gianmarco Segato. Uh, can you comment on why you think throughout the history you've chronicled, so many artists we consider to have been on the cutting edge of the avant-garde are attracted to designing operas from the tra traditional canon, works that some people today might see as traditional or outmoded? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um... You know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if, the, if artists are always uh, attracted necessarily to the idea of doing uh, classical, uh, classical music or early music or, I mean, it's, it's true that a lot of artists uh, love to, to do the Taubeflitte, for instance, it's probably the most produced artist. I think it might be a, a kind of a, uh, more of a question of, of what's, what's proposed to them. Um, I mean, a lot of artists uh, really like the idea of, of working on a contemporary piece, where from the very beginning, they're actually working with the composer, which was the case of Am Ampang and, and, and York Fidman. Um, I think that's, uh, from what I hear coming from artists, that's the absolute uh, ideal situation is to be working on a new work of art, a new, a new uh, opera altogether. Here we have a question from Philip Furhofer. Um, he asks, he says, in the same way that there is the same creativity and inventions when you looked at the history of set design, do you find that if you look at the history of set design for drama as opposed to opera, were there the same great artists for real dramas of Goethe, Schiller, or Shakespeare, um, or do you think it needed the music? That, that's a very good question coming from Philip. Um, I, I don't know, first of all, I don't know that much about uh, the history of theatrical stage design. Um, and I'm, but one thing seems sure is that operatic stage design seemed to lag behind, it certainly lagged behind ballet. Uh, it seemed that uh, over the years, uh, it took a long time. I mean, we've got these examples that I've given, but many of them are, are exceptions. And you've got to imagine what's happening in, you know, in the regular sort of provincial opera houses and so on. Uh, opera was very slow to make uh, progress in stage design. Uh, I think the, the, the most brilliant examples uh, of early stage design are actually in the ballet. I'm not sure about the theater. Um, okay, we have a question now from Riga, and please forgive me in advance for mispronouncing the name. Jegors Jerohomonovich. Is that 
Yes, I know. A little closer. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, we know some examples when very well-known visual artists didn't produce a very convincing work for opera. What are the factors that make a great visual artist also a great set designer? What's the secret? Well, you know, I think the secret, uh, unless you're William Kentridge and you really master also uh, practically all aspects of the, of the, of the process of theatre making, uh, what the secret is, is having a really good and cooperative team. Uh, and when you don't, um, sometimes you have examples of where, where everyone is brilliant and everyone is actually famous, but it's a flop. And it's obviously because there was no uh, collaboration and understanding be between those different different uh, participants. So I think the key is really is really the, the cooperation and the talking and the communicating between the, 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 the conductor, uh, the director and, and the stage designer in particular. Another question is, since so many of the experiments in stage design from 1800 to the present originated with fine artists, I was wondering what role set designers or rather people who officially studied the discipline of set design played. It seems there was and still is a higher value placed on those who did not have a practical training in theater. What is the situation like today with much more experimental stage design study programs and designers such as Bettina Meyer and Katrin Brack? You know, uh, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. I, I think I mean, over, uh, over the centuries, I mean, there were amazing uh, uh, stage designers who were not artists. I mean, starting with uh, Simon Quaglio, who we spoke about right in the very beginning, who was uh, with his whole family and this whole sort of, um, uh, um, hierarchy of, of, of stage designers. He was one of the very, very best and did uh, numerous stage designs over a period of about 30 years, but remained really uh, officially just a, a stage design artist and did his whole career in Munich. And there were many examples of these also in the Baroque era of, uh, of highly competent stage designers who were not artists in, in their own right. Um, I don't know uh, what, what the, actually what the second part of that question was. Um, did that, did I answer it? The second part of the question is about have things changed now that today there are many more study programs, experimental stage design study programs and designers such as Bettina Meyer and Katrin Brock. Yes, definitely. I think, there, I think there's some brilliant stage design in the stage design programs uh, that are, um, that are available and that people are participating in are really extraordinary. So, you know, and we are seeing the results and, you know, I'm thinking of the designers for, of Christoph Walikowski, his designer, I've forgotten her name, um, Margot Jata, uh, people like that. They, they are just absolutely extraordinary and, and you don't necessarily want to make the difference anymore between artist and, you know, and theater designer because, you know, it, they, they, they are artists. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, there are, there are some very, very good people coming out, for sure. Okay, um, we're just going to take a few more questions. This is from Eduardo Ghisoni. Um, if you had to choose which stage design has moved you the most, to have an absolute favorite? That's a very, very difficult question. Um, hmm. Um, now I'm going to contradict myself completely because I think some of the most successful uh, operas that I've seen in the last few years uh, have been those of, uh, of Christoph Walikowski, also from the point of view of the design. And here we're talking about, about Margot, Margot Schalter, who is not uh, officially an artist. She, hasn't, she doesn't produce art in galleries and so on. But these, these, this is, I think these are some of the most beautiful productions I've seen visually and also from the point of view of, of the stage design. Um, I obviously really like very, very much the work of William Kentridge. And I think this is uh, so successful because, uh, because you have uh, an extraordinary artist who just has everything in hand and knows exactly what he's doing and is completely independent. I mean, you have to imagine that William, when he uh, starts working on an opera, he's doing everything in South Africa, he's, 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 he's controlling everything from the very beginning of what he wants to do. He's got a team that he's worked with for years and years. And so the result of that, um, 
I've, I've never been disappointed, you know, be it his Botsek or his Lulu. Um, these are just extraordinary, uh, uh, extraordinary stage designs and extraordinary uh, productions. Okay, we have one question and then the final question is a question that two separate people have asked. Um, this uh, penultimate question is, do you have any examples of sets for the theater in the round or outdoor productions done by such artists? In the round, um, you know, there, there's uh, wonderful productions, I think, that have been done at Aix-en-Provence, especially when they use um, their outdoor theater uh, in, uh, in Saint-Jean. Um, I remember seeing a, a beautiful uh, production by Buffalo, um, the, an Entführung. Uh, this, this was, was beautiful because it um, it uses there's a minimum of possibilities when you when, when you're working in a round, um, and I would say yes, uh, th there are a number of them that have been very successful. I mean, one uh, when you say in the round, I mean one would want to think back to um, to Peter Brook's Carmen, uh, which I think was a land uh, a landmark in uh, in operatic theater uh, because it was in the round. It was you know in in his in his Pouf de Nord, uh, using a minimum of of of, uh, of means, and uh, I think was a, a performance that uh, would that marked all of us. Well, as a final question, which I said came in from two different people, who are the visual artists that you would like to see doing stage sets uh, for opera in the future? Um, all of them, I think. Uh, I, you know, any artists I've been involved with, I, I, I've always been curious uh, to see. Uh, it, how they could get involved and, and if they would like to get involved. I mean, there's one, one artist whom I, I, I love very much is, is Tony Craig. And he's always said that he would never do stage design. He would never sort of stoop to doing uh, stage design. But um, I think if he did, uh, it could be fascinating, especially since he's, he's, uh, he's someone who's so involved in literature and, and knows music so well. Uh, I think, yeah, I would say Tony Craig. Well, thank you very, very much. This was really fascinating. And as you saw, the questions came in. So uh, we appreciate your doing this. And as I said, it's absolutely in the spirit of the arts arena where we like to bring together different artistic disciplines. So this was wonderful. And we very much hope that your quarantine um, will and we did not have any officers break. No, no, they didn't come. They, they, they're going to arrive now. <laughs> and if you will permit me just to say to the people watching tonight that the next Arts Arena live streaming is going to be something both Arts Arena people know and a little bit different. We're doing the United Nations Association Film Festival, which we do every year. We've done it for something like 12 years. But since we're not having a live audience, the two films that I've chosen are going to be available from May 10th until May 17th. And then on May 17th, we will have the directors talking about the films um, as the Arts Arena event. So you will have had a week to look at them. The topic is a very interesting contemporary topic. Unfortunately, it's contemporary, which is how people get caught up in conspiracy theories, cult, the indoctrination that comes. One is an experiment that went wrong at Stanford University, where a professor to a class that said they wanted, they didn't understand how people in Germany, we've had a lot of Germans in this presentation tonight, how people in Germany could um, be indoctrinated into the Nazi ideology. And so the professor did an experiment to show how it can be done. And it went wrong in that there was a real cult that developed out of the classroom experience. And the second film is a study, it's a documentary from a German school where um, it was extraordinary to find out that the overwhelming majority of the students knew nothing about the Nazis or the Holocaust. And so it really is dealing with the kind of issues that we're finding in our own countries today about how people who otherwise seem perfectly intelligent and cultured and fine can get caught up in a 
a very dangerous ideology. So we hope we will be sending out invitations, giving you the link to see the two films from May 10th to May 17th, and then our discussion with the directors and the people involved in the film on May 17th. So again, thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, Sam from the Arts Arena, Michelle from Columbia Global Centers. This was really a beautiful presentation and I can't wait until we can all go back to the opera. Yeah. <laughs> so until we can have our night at the opera. Yeah, I look forward to that too, Audrey. Thank so, you very, very much. Thank you, Denise, and bon courage with the quarantine. Thank you. Bye-bye.